Yes. Why, why agony? I, 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 I mean, I think that is a problem. Um, it, as you say, it's, n it's not a problem to think why we have pain at all. Um, but par partly we need to flinch away when we're being burned. Or, it's nature spanking us, isn't it, really? That's right, but it's not just spanking <laughs> immediately to get away. It's also saying don't do that again. Mm. Uh, and so when you burn yourself, um, you don't only flinch immediately back and drop the hot coal you just mistakenly picked up, but you never, go, you never do it again. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very strong... Um, inhibition against doing it again. But I am a bit puzzled by why it has to be so damn painful, because you, the, I speculate in the book, couldn't you just have a little system of, of a red flag going up in the brain which says don't do that again? I mean, why wouldn't that work? Uh, why does it have to be so painful? And I think that's a rather profound problem. The, uh, the explanation I try to offer, which is not really an, it's a kind of partial explanation, is that we are conflicted. We have different impulses pulling us in different ways. And it's almost as though the genes don't trust us to take the right decisions because we might be tempted to, um, to uh, emphasize too much one of our motivations rather than, rather than another. You have colleagues who are evolutionary biologists and paleontologists who, who uh, are experts in their field, as you are, but they nonetheless believe in God. Do you think it's incompatible to believe in God and to, and to believe in evolutionary theory? It's not strictly incompatible in the sense that there are people who do both, as you've just said, so it can't be literally incompatible. I suspect it's quite hard, and I suspect that those people who do it do it at a cost of a certain amount of double-think, a certain amount of partitioning of the mind, uh, thinking one way on Sundays and, and another way in the rest of the week. Um, there are those who, who really are partitioned and who quite astonishingly manage to... Um, I mean, I've, I've heard stories of an, of an astronomer, for example, who writes learned papers on the origin of the solar system, assuming and accepting that, it's, that the solar system is 4.6 4, 4 billion years old. And yet, if you ask him what he believes, he believes the world is only 6,000 years old. Yet he manages to... I mean, that seems to me... He seems to me to be a charlatan. I mean, I can't imagine how you can actually partition your mind that much. But there are plenty of others who, who, take, who accept all of science as fact, but think that God perhaps set up the machinery in the first place, or perhaps that God... Um, designed the whole machinery in such a way that it would unfold in the way that it has. So there are all these questions that are well beyond the science we have today. Why was there a big game? Why, why do we have laws in the universe? Um, these are questions. I mean, they may not be. They may or may not be answerable uh, by the idea of there being a, a guiding hand, a, 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 a conscious mind directing the whole of the universe's existence. You, could, you can't rule that out, well, I suppose, can you? you? No, you can't. But it, but it doesn't help. I mean, it, it's a, it's, a, it, it doesn't actually explain anything. Um, what would a universe li be like if it didn't have laws? I mean, it's an, it's an, odd, it's an odd idea that, that, that because the universe is lawful, uh, be because there are um, uh, laws that physicists can, can destroy in, in the world of nature, that somehow this implies a lawgiver. It really doesn't. I mean, if it, you would, it would be a very odd kind of universe if it, if it changed its mind all the time. You do in your book compare creationists to Holocaust deniers. That's, that's, that strikes me and probably a lot of other people as a very unfair analogy. I mean, one, one school of thought is born of, I suppose, of faith, and the other one is born of you know, race hatred. They're very different things. It's, it's a harsh comparison to make. It's a harsh comparison to make if you, if you take it. As, as I've said before in this conversation, um, analogies are not intended to be taken in every detail. Um, it comes immediately after the one about the Latin teacher. It's the same thing. It's... it's um, if you're, if you're a teacher of European history and you're teaching about the Holocaust, just as the Latin teacher has to contend with the snapping terriers who deny that the Romans ever existed, the, the teacher of European history who talks about the Holocaust has to contend with, with um, people who deny that the Holocaust uh, ever happened. Now, both these are history deniers, and, and um, people who deny evolution are history deniers. It doesn't mean that the political motive for denying is the same in each case. Of course it isn't. Um, the, the political motive in the case of Holocaust deniers is, as you say, probably hatred. Um, in the case of evolution deniers, I don't know what it is, but it's probably... It might even be hatred, actually. I mean, it's not that, that far. I don't know. When, far I, when I was doing philosophy, I was told we well, can arrive at knowledge two ways, and that's through reason or through faith. And I suppose that's just knowledge derived at through faith as opposed to... I reason. cannot imagine who taught you philosophy that you could, that, 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 that you could derive knowledge by faith. Um, that is the very last thing you should be doing. You should be deriving knowledge by, by evidence. 
Um, faith is, a, is an excuse. Faith is a cop-out, a lack of evidence. Is it likely that all life on Earth originates from a single ancestor? All surviving life on Earth almost certainly originates from a single ancestor, as we know, because the genetic code is all but universal in a highly complex way, and the details in which it is universal are apparently arbitrary. So uh, it's almost inconceivable that, um, it, you, that, 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 that you can't trace all life back to one ancestor. That doesn't mean that there weren't other forms of life which have since died out. And there may even... Paul Davies, who left Australia quite recently, thinks that we should be actively looking for other forms of life. No form of life has yet been discovered that is not based upon DNA and the same code uniting or linking DNA to, to protein. Davis's hope is that there might be other forms of life, perhaps resembling bacteria in some respects, which use a different code altogether, maybe not even DNA. But if they do emerge, if they should emerge spontaneously somehow, uh, they would have to deal with what that initial organism never had to deal with, which was bacteria. That's right. I mean, Darwin... They, they, the initial whatever it was never had to rot, did it? Or, or what? Absolutely right. I mean, um, Darwin himself, actually, in, in, in other language, because it was writing in Victorian times, speculated that if there was more than... that if, if any new form of life did, did arise, it would be eaten. And so we probably wouldn't know, wouldn't know about it. I, I suppose we still come back down to what that ancestor was. Uh, and how improbable, how impro e even over geological time, that in some kind of warm pond somewhere, as, as, as Darwin once said, that there'd be somehow a spontaneous mix uh, in the chemical stew that was around at the time, that a, that a, a living thing should emerge to be organised to the extent of complexity that it could not only uh, be alive, but also self-replicate. That's, isn't that weird? Well, I wouldn't use the word also. Self-replicating self is, the, is the necessary thing. You don't need to use the word alive. Um, we don't know how improbable it was. Uh, as soon as somebody discovers life on another planet, if they ever do, then we shall immediately have, a, we have an immediately better idea of how improbable it was. If uh, life were discovered elsewhere in the solar system, say on Mars, then that would be a staggering fact. I mean, that would, that would immediately show almost certainly there's life swarming all over the universe. I doubt that, as I've said before. Um, the other extreme would be that this is literally the only example of life anywhere in the entire universe. I don't believe that either. No, I find that a depressing thought too, quite frankly. Well, I don't care if it's depressing or not. No, I think, no I think, you're not <laughs> sentimental about these no, things. I am, I'm no. afraid. But, but um, mm. if that were true, and it, we can't rule it out, then, it, then the consequence would be that the origin of life on this planet was vanishingly improbable, and we'd be wasting our time even speculating about how it happened. There's a group, uh, there are various, several groups that call themselves transhumanist, and they're made up of academics at your, your old place, at, at Oxford and Cambridge and other universities. And one of them, a man called Max Moore, and that's a pseudonym, wrote a letter to Mother Nature, and this is kind of their philosophy, if you like, and I'll just paraphrase it quickly here. Dear Mother Nature, we tr are truly grateful for what you have made us. However, with all due respect, we must say you have in many ways done a poor job with the human constitution. You've made us vulnerable to disease and damage. You compel us to age and die, just as we're beginning to attain wisdom. You held out on us by giving the sharpest senses to other animals. You gave us limited memory, poor impulse control, and tribalistic xenophobic urges. And you forgot to give us the operating manual for ourselves. And it goes on <laughs> to say, we'll pick it up from here. Thanks, nature. We'll use cyborg technology, uh, genetic technology, to improve ourselves from now on and do it in a guided way. I don't know. What's your, just, what's your response to that? At that I've, I haven't read that before. Mm. I don't want to give a, 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 a moral or value judgment res response to it. There's a lot of sense in, in what it said, and I and it is it's technically feasible that we could take control over matters that have in the past been under no control, have been um, uh, random mutation and then non-random selection uh, producing all living things. It is technically feasible. Um, as to whether I want to actually join the what do you call, transhuman, society, transhuman yes. society, that's yes. another matter. Well, well, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting thing, though. It seems to be already taking place. I mean, cyber technology is with us already in many forms, whether it's a pacemaker or artificial... Uh, artificial uh, organs that we have in our bodies and uh, we're now looking at therapies that may allow us to live much much longer this is all this is all changing i just i suppose the question is here one of, one of speed yes because in a, in a way it's been going on ever since medicine i mean with, with antibiotics and and uh, vaccination and things like that is already improving on mother nature the tone of the book, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, is it past? It's, it's very forthright, as you might expect from someone such as yourself. I just wonder, have you ever changed a creationist's mind? Oh, that you're yes. Aware of? I you believe have? I have. Yes, I believe I have. Have they come um, up to you and said I've, I've had lots of nice letters from people who've, been, who've, who've said that they've, been, they've had their complete life changed.
<laughs> Life-changing Richard Dawkins. Wonderful to meet you, sir, and thank you so much for being my guest in conversation today. It's been delightful. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more information and interviews, visit abc.net.au slash conversations.